Thank you, Liz, and uh, for the kind introduction. And um, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank as well the Cancer Genomic Consortium for allowing me to present today. Um, I would like to start by um, the title of my presentation. And let's see if we can. Okay. So I will be talking to you about constitutional methylation testing in the clinical setting. Um, I do have no financial interest uh, or relationship to disclose. Uh, for the learning objective of this talk today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of DNA methylation testing currently that are applied in the clinical settings uh, with a focus on imprinting disorders. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, start talking about the methylation, the DNA methylation signature, which is um, the new tool for brain classification, specifically in neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, I'm going to discuss with you what signature are known, uh, what are the clinical implications, and how we can use these signatures to identify classify variant or as an agnostic test or to predict diagnosis. So first of all, I would like to give a brief overview of DNA methylation. So DNA methylation do occur, it's the chemical modification of a DNA that will affect gene expression without altering the underlying sequence. So it's the chemical modification of the DNA that occur, the addition of the methyl group at the cytosine that is followed by a guanine. And that's what I will be referring to as CPG dinucleotide. And I will be presenting methylation throughout my presentation as these lollipops. So, uh, as a general rule, DNA methylation, um, the promoter region that are avoided of DNA methylation, as presented in these empty lollipops, um, will allow for gene expression. However, when these gene promoters are methylated, this will lead to gene repression or inactive gene transcription. As an overview of DNA methylation, the distribution of DNA methylation across the genome is variable. We see that there is high dense CPG sites that uh, when they are together, we call them a CPG island, and they tend to be unmethylated when present at the promoter regions. And we have other CPGs that are um, isolated across the genome. Also, we see that there is high methylated CPGs overlapping transposable elements. In the genome, we know that there is um, 28 million CPG dinucleotide in the genome, and these are mostly heavy, heavily methylated, and the CPG island that exists at the promoter regions usually are unmethylated. What genomic loci undergo DNA methylation in mammals? So this is important to know which regions are methylated uh, and in normal state or unmethylated in normal state and following um, a mutation or uh, a disruption that is a transformation of this normal cell to an abnormal cell and that, cause lead, and that could lead to a disease state. Uh, one of the really well studied and most important example is the imprinted genes. These are the genes that are expressed in a monoallelic fashion, uh, but in a parent of origin specific manner, which means that, for example, this is an example of gene that is only expressed from the maternal allele, while it's silenced from the paternal allele, and it is silenced by methylating um, the promoter region, for example, or an imprinting center on the paternal allele. When the, um, and this imprinted gene is usually expressed only from one allele. Uh, when the paternal allele is expressed in a transformed cell, this could lead to an imprinting disorder, which we will discuss uh, very soon. Uh, also imprinted, um, also methylation could occur uh, at repeated sequences. And this is when these sequences uh, are methylated, um, this could lead uh, to a normal state. However, when these sequences, the repeat sequences loses methylation, it could lead to genomic instability and disease. Um, and another important example is the tumor, tumor suppressor gene, which is usually unmethylated in normal state. However, in transformed cells, uh, following methylation of the promoter region of these tumor suppressor genes, this could lead to the development of tumor. So currently in the clinical diagnostic, the methylation test exists for these imprinting disorders. Um, and um, 
these are the seven kind of most known imprinting disorders, and as well, they are very rare diseases, and they are caused by mutation, um, different type of mutations uh, in the imprinted genes, or epigenetic alteration, or copy number change, or parental UPD, which we'll discuss. And what I wanted to highlight is that um, several chromosomes have been associated with these imprinting disorders. And for example, back with Wiedemann syndrome, chromosome 11 um, is associated, the same imprinted domain on chromosome 11 could lead to either back with Wiedemann syndrome, which is an overgrowth uh, uh, imprinting disorder, or silver Russell syndrome, which is uh, an undergrowth imprinting disorder. So the same for Angelman syndrome and Prader Willi syndrome, which are both of them caused by alteration of the imprinted domain on chromosome 15. So uh, several, uh, it's important to understand the different molecular alterations that are associated with these imprinting disorders in order to develop the proper test that will capture these for diagnostic purposes. So if we look at um, this example, where we see in general, the top gene is the gene that is present, which is most of the genes in our genome. They are bialelically expressed from the maternal and paternal chromosomes. However, imprinted genes, as I mentioned, in this case is a maternally imprinted gene expressed. It's a maternally expressed gene while it is um, silent on the paternal allele. And this one is another imprinted gene that is expressed from the paternal allele and silent on the maternal allele. So uh, several molecular mechanisms for imprinting disorders have been identified, and these include juniparental disomy. In this case, we're showing you the maternal, where the two um, chromosomes are from the maternal origin, um, and there is no paternal origin for that in this case. Um, we can have a copy number variant where we have a deletion of one imprinted region or one gene or an imprinting center. The most common is the DNA methylation change, where we lose methylation uh, or we gain methylation at some of these imprinted regions that could lead to either silencing or overexpression of that imprinted gene. And finally, uh, if we have a genetic mutation in the expressed allele of, the, of that gene, such as the case here, uh, this gene. Uh, this gene, which is imprinted from, which is expressed from the paternal allele, if this uh, allele has a point mutation, this could lead to an imprinting disorders. So uh, the commonly used test that has been developed for clinical and validated for clinical testing of imprinting disorders is the methylation-specific multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification, which provides semi-quantitative profiles of methylation and as well copy number uh, alterations. And uh, there has been several tests for chromosomal region. As I mentioned, chromosome 15, for example, is responsible for the same imprinted domain is responsible for the um, imprinting defect uh, for both prader willi and Angelman syndrome. There is another test for chromosome 11 region that can allow the simultaneous assessment of uh, imprinting defect for Beckwith and Russell Silver syndrome. Uh, there is also um, another test for uniparental disomy for chromosome 7, which is associated as well with 10% of silver Russell syndrome or with UPD14. And because recently we have learned and identified that imprinted genes, um, they are if you have a defect on one imprinted locus that is associated with the disease, for example, uh, if you have a defect at the KCNQ1 uh, region overlapping KVDMR in with wiedemann syndrome, 30% of these patients who have this defect could have a multilocus imprinting defect. Uh, therefore, there has been another um, uh, also acid that has been developed to determine not only maternal and paternal triploidy, but also could be used to determine multilocus imprinting defect. So it is important to capture 
all the different defects, but you have to understand that, for example, in order to, if we want to test, if we suspect, for example, in a backward patient that there is a CDKN1C mutation, this test will not allow us to identify that mutation. And therefore, there has to be a targeted sequencing of the CDKN1C gene in order to identify the mutation. Um, also, for segmental uniparental disomy of chromosome 11, which occur in 25% of backward vitamin syndrome, we need to do microsatellite typing for that purpose. So for imprinting disorders, and I would like to highlight that, that there has been several development, but there is no one test that can capture everything. And um, however, in the new DNA methylation test that I will be switching to, which is based on the arrays, on macroarrays, also I don't think we, it will capture as well uh, the DNA methylation, all the molecular alteration that exists in imprinting disorders. So the DNA methylation testing using the microarray is a new tool for variant classification in neurodevelopmental disorders. And this has been developed with the hope that it can reduce uncertainty in these neurodevelopmental syndrome and improve diagnostic yield. How? By switching this uncertain classification of the variants to either benign or pathogenic classifications. So just to give you an overview about NDDs before we, I explain to you the DNA methylation testing that, uh, and all the advances that has been uh, generated in this regards. Neurodevelopmental disorders involve our um, impairments of the development of the brain and mostly the central nervous system. And there is um, many overlapping clinical feature or overlapping syndrome that converge into similar phenotype. The most common, um, phenotype identified in this uh, in these NDDs is the intellectual disability and the worldwide prevalence of these disorders is one percent and they constitute the most frequent reason for referral to pediatric genetic services and 10 percent of these individuals also have autism spectrum disorders. Uh, the recent um, improvement in diagnostic and in sequencing technology has really uh, improved dramatically the diagnostic yield for moderate to severe intellectual disability. And this has been by the introduction of the microarray in the beginning of this decade, and as well the introduction of exome sequencing, which allowed the diagnosis of over 70% of patients and the identification of many new uh, genetic disorders uh, in neurodevelopmental syndrome. And the genetic studies for these NDDs have taught us a lot about these disorders. So we learn now, we know about the genetic heterogeneity associated with NDD. Uh, we know that there has, there has been many monogenic single gene disorder identified in these um, syndromes. And that the, the NOVO, most importantly, loss of function variant, are kind of the main cause of these uh, NDDs. Um, however, 30% of these reported variants are variant of uncertain significance, and therefore there was this kind of need to find functional tools to be able to classify these variants and reduce the diagnostic odyssey for these patients. Um, we have also learned that these NDDs are related at the molecular level, and they could be part of the same protein complexes. The other important things is that the, one of the most common and rich category of genes that has been identified in NDDs are the epigenetic regulators. And what I'm showing you is a recent um, beautiful depiction kind of of the, all the um, disorders of the epigenetic machinery that are caused by these epigenetic regulators that could be either these are the genes that write the histone code or could erase the histone of the methylation code or the reader of the histone code as well as the remodelers. Um, one of the common feature of all of these um, of mutation um, that cause uh, disease associated with these genes is that they all have majority of them intellectual, dis intellectual disability and followed by growth abnormalities. 
And we use these, um, um, the first studies that has been generated uh, using an identification of DNA methylation signatures were done using a cohort of patients with mutation in some of these epigenetic um, regulators. The assumption is that these epigenetic regulators, they are um, together with the, uh, which are the chromatin modifications and together with the DNA methylation change, they will constitute the epigenetic code that is important during early embryonic development. So if we have the proper cues with a proper methylation mark and the proper uh, chromatin modification mark, we do expect that we will have the normal epigenetic trajectory that will lead to a normal uh, development. However, if we have a mutation in any of these epigenetic regulators um, and the absence of methylation mark and chromatin modification mark could lead to a shift in early embryonic development, a shift of the epigenetic trajectory that could lead to a typical development. So based on this crosstalk of DNA methylation and epigenetic and chromatin modification, we suspected that we will be able to identify, to really use this crosstalk in order to be able to link the genotype and the phenotype. And we asked the question, do patients with neurodevelopment have identifiable and specific changes in their epigenome that can really be the bridge that will help us to link the genotype to the phenotype or better understand the phenotype based on their genotype? And could we find the answer in peripheral blood? And the reason why we chose peripheral blood is because it's the most common biological specimen that has been is used for testing these uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. And we can use banked leftover DNA or banked DNA from the genetic test uh, in order to identify these signatures or test uh, these signatures. So how the methylation signature are developed? So as I mentioned, we'll start with genomic DNA from whole blood or um, that we bisulfate convert and we run it. Currently, the most um, used array is the Illumina Epic, which allow us to assess 850,000 CPG dinucleotide simultaneously in each sample. Each chip will allow us to measure the methylation, generate methylation profile on eight samples. And before the methylation Epic, there is a lot of data that has been generated on the 450K array, which has half of the sites, but all the sites from the 450 are included in this Illumina methylation epic, and that's why we can use both arrays to um, uh, compare the methylation profiles. Once the methylation, uh, once the methylation profile are generated, uh, we perform DNA methylation, what we call differential DNA methylation analysis. And in order to really generate the signature, uh, this differential methylation analysis will occur on a discovery cohort of disease and a discovery cohort of control. So these are, uh, the disease cohort will be a cohort with a mutation, with pathogenic variant in a certain gene and with the clinical diagnosis of a certain syndrome associated with that mutation. Um, following this analysis, a DNA methylation signature is identified, and that signature is really consists of a set of different CPG sites that that are identified in blood, but that can robustly and consistently differ uh, that are differentially methylated in individuals, as I can, I, I'm showing you here, in individuals with a certain disease, and they are uh, very different from the controls. And the presence of this methylation pattern usually indicate the presence of a pathogenic variant. However, we need to, uh, in order to be uh, confident that this DNA methylation signature is valid, we need to perform sensitivity and specificity testing. And to do the sensitivity, we usually um, run the methylation profile on an independent disease cohort and validate it uh, to have the same profile like the disease. And the specificity, we run it on an independent control cohort. And finally, we generate as well, um, test this 
uh, signature um, to, to see how it is really its utility for classifying variant of uncertain significance in the disease that we uh, have tested initially and how does it perform when compared to clinically overlapping neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, I'm just gonna kind of describe to you in a schematic way how the reference epigenome is generated. So once we have generated this, um, once we have run the profile on the typical controls, if we, this is just, I'm giving you a presentation of five different genomic region and how the reference epigenome will look like in the controls, like kind of in this, a much more schematic representation of this um, methylation profile here. And then if, uh, if I have a neurodevelopmental disorder with mutation in three different genes and three different disease cohort, we expect that the methylation signature that we identify for each gene is specific for each gene and different from the second methylation signature for the other gene, uh, for gene two and the third methylation signature that is associated with gene three. Therefore, this will allow us really to be able to identify a unique and specific DNA methylation signature that can classify each gene with its associated cohort of disease separate from the other genes and the other signatures. So what signatures are known so far? There has been over 50 different DNA methylation signatures that have been identified. And this is from back in 2020, this uh, beautiful wheel that depicts all the DNA, all the gene mutations that have been um, uh, studied. And uh, this, the, the syndrome that is associated with each gene mutation. And again, it shows as well that intellectual disability for these genes is the most common feature followed by the um, growth anomaly and facial anomalies. Uh, in this uh, orangey kind of yellowish color in the middle, it depicts all the signature for which, all the genes for which a signature have been developed. Uh, however, since 2020, we have identified a signature for EZH2 and a signature last month, we just published a signature for ASXL1. And we know that some of the genes such as MACB2, where there is no signature associated with it, we and others have tried to identify a signature for MACB2, which is associated with Rett syndrome in blood and we're not able to identify any signature yet in blood. So there has been a lot of advances for signature discovery. And from the research perspective, we have developed um, a portal for DNA methylation data analysis and classification for the signature. It's called Epigen Central, which is hosted by SickKids. And this portal will allow you to, it's a freely available to everyone and it's open access. Uh, if you have a methylation profile of a variant in any of these 10 syndromes, you can uh, input the methylation profile and select the classification for the disease that you're interested in or for all these 10 syndromes. And you will get an SVM score, which is the support vector machine, um, a score that will give you the probability of pathogenicity of this variant for each of these uh, syndromes. How, in addition, there has been also a clinical test that has been developed for these DNA methylation signature. And this is clinical test is called EpiSign. And this is from the Greenwood Genetic, uh, Genetic Center. Uh, from their website, this is the list of the genes that uh, they are within this version of the EpiSign for the disease that the genes and their associated disorders that you can assess the methylation for. So what are the clinical implications? And I think this is the most important is when, when we develop a test or identify a new test, it's important for us to understand what are the clinical implications of this, of this test and will it be useful for clinical setting uh, and how we can use it in the clinical and for what purposes. So the first thing is, as I mentioned, is to really classify, we think it is a functional tool that is able to classify variant in NDDs, and also it can give us uh, clues into the pathophysiology of the disorder. 
Um, so this is an example uh, for a signature that we have identified for Soto syndrome. Uh, Soto syndrome is an overgrowth disorder. And here I'm showing you uh, the heat map of the different uh, patients and controls. So each uh, column represents a patient and each row represents a CPG site. Um, in this study, we had our discovery cohort consisted of 19 SOTO samples or from blood and 53 controls. We have identified a signature that could really strongly separate all SOTOS patients from control. And we found that this signature is um, mostly loss of methylation uh, as depicted in this blue color compared to the control. And this is just um, the volcano plot that shows indeed for all the significant CPG site that there is a genome-wide loss of DNA methylation in SOTOs compared to controls. So following the discovery of the DNA methylation signature, we moved next to the uh, sensitivity and specificity, testing the sensitivity and the specificity of the signature. And as I uh, mentioned before, uh, to do that, we used uh, an independent cohort of SOTOS patients with mutation, pathogenic mutation in NST1, and these are called the SOTOS validation, and they are depicted in purple in here. Um, as well, we used over 1,000 um, independent control cohort. What I'm showing you in this graph is a correlation similarity to either uh, the NST1 DNA methylation profile from the discovery cohort or to the control profile based on the discovery cohort as well. So then we ask the question, are these patients, the red line here is really the decision boundary, and every sample that uh, cluster or that is high more correlation, have more correlation to the metal, to the sort of profile will be classified as positive, and every sample that has more methylation profile similar to the control will be classified as negative. And in this uh, classification, you could see that it did indeed provide 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity as each sample classified in their uh, respective category. Next, we move to classify the variant of uncertain significance by testing the utility of that signature in order to classify variant of uncertain significance in NST1. In this case, these variant of uncertain significance are represented in these green axis, and we had 16 of them. Nine of them had methylation profile more similar to the SOTOS profile, and then seven of them had methylation profile more similar to the control. And those ones that were positive and the ones that were negative as well, for a subset of them, we did have um, enough clinical information and pictures of these patients. And in order to really test and validate that the classification based on the methylation is definitely correct. Uh, two clinicians that were blinded to the DNA methylation classification had actually reviewed the clinical uh, features and the pictures of these patients, and they were able to um, match 100% the clinical presentation to our DNA methylation testing. Uh, in addition, we wanted to see if another NDD, which is another overgrowth syndrome called Weaver syndrome, uh, that is caused by mutation in another histone methyl transferase called EZH2. And uh, these two, SOTOS and Weaver syndrome, uh, they are clinically uh, difficult to distinguish early on. And also we were able to identify that most of the patient with Weaver and pathogenic mutation in EZH2 do have a methylation profile more similar to control and do not classify with the SOTOs, which really indicated the high utility of this DNA methylation signature for SOTOS syndrome um, to classify variant in SOTOS, in NST1. Uh, in addition, what we were able to show is that the genes that underlie these CPG sites are enriched in functional terms that relate to the clinical presentation. They are really enriched in neurons, uh, neuronal development, and cellular differentiation, in addition to embryonic developmental pathway, and really could give clues into the pathophysiology of the disorder. 
another clinical utility of DNA methylation is that it can be detected in tissues other than blood, and that's really important. So uh, in order to test this, if we, uh, if we, um, we know that the methylation, the mutation did occur early during embryonic development. And if we think that the DNA methylation uh, is associated with a mutation, a genetic mutation early on, and since the mutation is carried on throughout in all our cells, we do expect that the methylation maybe also could be identified in many different cells, um, differentiated cells. And uh, we had limited information about that hypothesis. However, uh, for Soto's syndrome, uh, and that's the only disease so far where we were able to, we had access to patients, um, another tissue from the patient with pathogenic mutation in NST1. In this case, we had access to three uh, fibroblasts uh, from three different patients. And we compared the methylation profile of these fibroblasts to the controls uh, fibroblasts using the uh, blood-derived NST1 signature. And we were able to classify SOTOS patients separately from control using the blood-derived signature, which indicate that the blood-derived signature could be reflected in other tissue. And this is, um, it will need further, definitely further uh, studies uh, to test in other tissues, such as buccal, saliva, et cetera. Uh, another clinical utility for these methylation signature is that they can help expedite clinical diagnosis in clinically overlapping conditions. I briefly mentioned Sotos and Weaver, but this is also another study that we have performed uh, on two clinically overlapping uh, syndromes, Kabuki, which is caused by mutations in either KMT2D and KDM6A, and CHARGE syndrome caused by mutation in CHT7. So in this case, what I'm showing you here are the DNA methylation signature specific for Kabuki and specific for control for charge and how using the signature, all the both signatures, the control that classifies separately from either one of them and the Kabuki, all of them clustered together. And these are the Kabuki patient with either mutation in KMT2D or KDM6A. We had only one patient in this case, and also the patient with charge syndrome using the charge um, machine learning model also had high uh, scores and all of these patients uh, classified as positive. So why this is important? It's important because in early infancy, when the typical facial feature, for example, for Kabuki or developmental mystorm are not fully established, it is really hard to clinically distinguish Kabuki from CHARGE syndrome. And it is also important as it can support the clinical diagnosis in early childhood and improve, to improve the clinical management for patients. So another important clinical utility is that DNA methylation signature can help in discovering new genotype phenotype correlation. Um, and this is, I'm gonna give you the example of a recent study that we published last year, where we had mutations, pathogenic mutations in um, patient um, within the SRCAP gene. We know that a mutation in the exon 33 and 34 of the SRCAP gene cause what we call floating harbor syndrome. However, mutation outside in the proximal and the um, and the distal region of the acid cap, they have been associated with, uh, we identified that they had the clinical uh, uh, features that are distinct from the floating harbor syndrome. And we wanted to see if we can establish a signature that can differentiate both of them. So initially we established a signature for acid cap, and this is an example of the machine learning model where um, the y-axis represent the prob probability of pathogenicity that goes from zero to one. And most of these SRCAP from our validation cohort, they had a higher probability for being SRCAP. And uh, we tested the signature for SRCAP against the proximal variant that are depicted in this um, um, dark, uh, black uh, dot, and then as well for those one in the distal region, and all of them classified as negative, similar to control, and to missense a SARCA variant, and to another uh, clinically overlapping syndrome caused by mutation in CRABP and EP300. 
um, then we uh, identified a signature that is specific for both proximal and the distal variant, and that also uh, distinguished them from the floating harbor uh, patient, which classify here as benign, whereas the patient with truncating variant in either the proximal or the distal region classify as pathogenic here. Uh, this have highlighted that indeed there is a novel NDD, and this novel NDD we call the developmental delay, hypotonia, etc. And uh, it is associated with uh, truncating mutations in ACERCAP, either in the proximal region or in the distal region. And these patients are phenotypically and epigenetically distinct from the floating harbor syndrome. Next, we also have used the DNA methylation signature in order to be able to elucidate functional relationships of genes uh, within protein complexes. Uh, I'm gonna give you the example of a recent study that we have published on Weaver syndrome. Um, I mentioned previously that Weaver is caused by a mutation in the histone methyl transferase, EZH2. And indeed, here we were able to identify a DNA methylation signature that separated Weaver, which are presented in red, from the controls. Um, and also, this signature uh, did actually classify Weaver separately from all other overgrowth syndrome, such as SOTOS caused by NSD1 mutation, DNMT3A. Uh, which cause pattern brown rahman syndrome, and CHD8, which cause autism and microcephaly. Next, we had access to mutations in a patient um, in, with the variant INSUS12 and EED. And as you can see here in this uh, cartoon, EED and SUS12, both of them belong to the along with EZ2 to the PRC2 complex. And they functionally work together to trimethylate the lysine 27 of the histone H3 and provide a repressive uh, chromatin state. So we wanted to test the mutations that we have. Um, that we had access in EED and SUS12 using the Weaver DNA methylation signature. And as I'm showing you here, three of the mutations that we had in EED did actually classify with the Weaver patient, and two of the mutations that we have with SUS12 did classify with the Weaver, and three of them classified with controls. So this indicates that definitely we know now that at the methylation level, um, these three genes work together uh, to, um, they have a similar DNA methylation profile and it could, could explain as well their uh, functional relationship uh, to, to trimethylate as well at the histone level to trimethylate lysine 27 of histone H3. Uh, another really interesting finding that we found within this study as well is that we had access to one um, variant, which is a missense variant in EZH2. And actually, I forgot to mention that 90 over like 85 to 90% of the variant in EZH2 and EED and SUS12 are all missense variants. So therefore, this uh, tool, uh, DNA methylation tool, is really important to classify these variants um, as pathogenic or benign. Uh, so we had access to a missense variant that was identified in a patient uh, with opposite clinical phenotype than Weaver. When we ran this variant on the methylation signature of Weaver, we identified, and this is the patient, that it has an opposite methylation profile. As you could see here, where there is loss of DNA methylation in Weaver, there is gain of methylation in this patient, and where there is gain of methylation in Weaver syndrome, there is loss of methylation in this patient. Um, and in order to validate that, and we proposed that this could be a gain of function variant, and indeed we were able to test it using uh, an enzymatic luminescence assay, where we show that there is increased enzymatic activity of EZH2738 variant compared to the wild type. So finally, I wanted to uh, mention if, uh, discuss with you and give you a few examples of how we can use the signatures that we developed or and we and others have developed um, as an agnostic test or, or first year test or to interpret results. 
Um, I'm gonna give you the example of this study as well, uh, where we had a patient that was diagnosed with liver syndrome back in 2012, uh, when at that time there was been no gene identified for liver syndrome. In 2014 and 2016, after the genes for liver syndrome is ZH2 and later on EED were identified, um, this patient was targeted sequencing for both gene was done uh, by uh, Dr. Bill Gibson in UBC and it was negative. We have performed in 2017 the DNA methylation profile and it was positive on the Weaver signature. And this is the patient here that classified with the Weaver patient. And uh, following this uh, kind of confirmation from the methylation that it is indeed have the same profile, we have requested exome sequencing and we were able to identify a mutation in SUS12 variant in this patient. Um, and as I mentioned before, that SUS12 again is another uh, component gene within the protein complex PRC2. So it took a few years in order to be able to identify the causative mutation of that patient um, in Weaver-like in Weaver syndrome. So when we should order the DNA methylation task for clinical purposes is really to classify variant of uncertain significance in a gene with a validated DNA methylation signature. And also we can use this test, uh, we can order it for clinical purposes to predict the genetic diagnosis when genetic testing is negative, but the clinical suspicion is really high. Um, and I'm gonna give you two examples where we, it does illustrate the utility of DNA methylation signature um, as an agnostic test as well, or to, or to support clinical diagnosis. So this is a case where we had a patient uh, that has been clinically um, diagnosed with Kabuki uh, syndrome and genetic testing over many years uh, using a tiered approach were all non-diagnostic. So chromosomal microarray was performed. In addition, this is the common genetic test for Kabuki is a targeted KDM6A and KMT2D gene sequencing and a multiple ligation dependent probe amplification analysis as well exome sequencing was done and all were non-diagnostics. Um, when we put this, um, the, fa the facial feature, the picture of this patient in phase two gene analysis, we identified that it did give us a match for Kabuki with a just out score of 0.61. We ran this patient on the DNA methylation signature specific for Kabuki syndrome, and we were able to identify that indeed it did has a positive DNA methylation score, which indicated a pathogenic variant. So uh, based on the methylation, we had a, a kind of confirmed the suspicion that it can be a pathogenic uh, variant uh, associated with Kabuki syndrome. So trio sequencing was then performed, genome sequencing, and it did indeed identify an AKB duplication that encompassed exon three of the KDM6A gene, um, which resulted in a frame shift due to 109 base pair insertion. The variant was then determined to be maternally inherited and therefore had important implications for future pregnancy planning in this case. Another case that we reported as well in the same uh, paper is uh, another uh, case which has been diagnosed as uh, Kabuki-like. Also targeted genetic testing was uh, negative. And um, however, phase two gene analysis did provide a Kabuki match with a just out score of 0.66. We ran the methylation uh, analysis on this patient and it did not classify as pathogenic for Kabuki syndrome. However, and neither did classify as control um, with a very low methylation profile. However, it did classify as what we call uncertain or intermediate. So we then have generated trio genome sequencing and identified a de novo pathogenic missense variant in the CDK13 gene. Um, and now we know that this gene has a DNA methylation signature and that this gene as well, um, um, like a, from the clinical perspective, it does present with a Kabuki-like phenotype. So we're, we were able again to resolve the clinical um, uh, diagnostic odyssey for that patient as well. 
So in summary, uh, the utility of DNA methylation signature, I hope I was able to kind of uh, share with you uh, the three main potential uses and explain very well uh, their uses in the clinical diagnostic setting. Uh, first is indeed to classify variant of uncertain significance. Next, to confirm clinical suspicion when a specific NDD is suspected on clinical ground, but no causative variant is detected by genomic sequencing, as I showed you previously, that will really trigger to search for a causative variant, as we did for CDK13 and for the KDN6A as well. And finally, to predict a diagnosis when other diagnostic avenues have failed. I would like to highlight that DNA methylation signature, as for now, can be used as an adjunct to genome sequencing to, uh, to allow classification of variant. But I want you as well to keep in mind that this is a new test, which is based on samples from rare disorders, and it will require time uh, until the full scope of its validity and limitations are known. But the future is bright and there is many uh, genetic disorder and many gene to and many epigenetic signature to identify. But however, as long we technology progress where we can and the cost is um, affordable and uh, better bioinformatic tools are available to detect both methylation uh, calls and genetic analyses, I think really this could be the future that could be employed in future diagnostic setting to detect both methylation and genetic um, changes in NDD and imprinting disorders, fragile X syndrome, and many other uh, diseases that uh, are associated with underlying epigenetic changes. So to finish, I would like to acknowledge all the members of the Wexberg Lab, um, the current members, which are bolded in here, and all the previous members who contributed to the development of DNA methylation signatures uh, for many epigenetic disorders, um, the bioinformatic analysis, which, uh, which was the, um, done with the support of Andre Turinsky um, and Michael Brudno. Um, all the patients, the clinicians, their family, uh, which contributed to uh, these cohort of patients, which are very rare, and we had to establish uh, the an international epigene consortium uh, with members from across the globe in order to be able to collect these variants in patients with multiple uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. And we would like also to thank uh, the funding agency, CIHR, Genome Canada, and Safari. And I will stop here and I will take your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I, I truly appreciate um, you taking the time to go through uh, so many examples of, of how your work uh, it has uh, demonstrated these profiles. We have a lot of questions. I'm going to start um, with um, some questions from the, the question and answer section. Uh, specifically, the first one was from Amar Husami, and he asked, for novel DNA methylation mutations of whole genome, what sequencing technology do you recommend, and what about nanopore sequencing? For to identify new mutations, definitely nanopore sequencing, it can be used. Definitely there is a limitation, which I don't know for all. I'm not a sequencing person, so I do not understand all the limitations in terms of the resolution of, and the sensitivity for like rare or mosaic variant, et cetera. Um, however, nanopore sequencing is now currently used to be able to detect DNA methylation and epigenetic and uh, mutation in the same setting as well. It's a, like another long read technology that I think it will be very useful in the future. Thank you. Um, Catherine Schultz also asks, are there any efforts to create a public reference database for DNA methylation akin to Genome AD? Um, that is the million dollar question, and this is a very important question. Um, so for us, uh, we are working in order to create and have access to all of these. Uh, so in Epigen Central, the database that created with open access, it has all the data. Uh, the raw data in addition to the methylation profiles and it has the tool as well to be able to either analyze methylation 
or classify variant. Um, and we are planning to update this reference database um, with more validated signature developed by our lab um, in the near future. So we are going toward really having uh, more and more DNA methylation classifiers available with their corresponding reference epigenome as well. That's fabulous, thank you. Um, Ritu Rathod, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any of these names, I should say that in advance. Um, they, they ask, are there are the population characteristics um, comparable or similar in discovery disease versus control cohorts? Absolutely. It is very important in terms of population characteristics. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, two main things that we account for. These are the sex and the age. So we make sure that we have uh, match sex in the population, in the disease uh, cohort, the discovery disease cohort and the control cohort. And we also match for age. Ethnicity, um, it's hard to match because we don't have uh, enough um, um, controls to, to cover all the different ethnic groups, and because we have patients from all over the world, and we haven't seen that it was a big issue yet in the genes that we, or the disease that we have studied, but definitely um, it's something when we have more cohort, it will be a, a good one to match for. Another thing that we I haven't discussed is that for all the patients that we, when we generate, we estimate the blood cell count proportions and we correct for that in both in our um, in disease and in our controls. Okay. Um, that's fabulous. So the next question is from Yan Jovenel, and again, I apologize if we get that name wrong. Um, they ask, do you have examples of similar studies using NGS tools allowing for direct detection of CPG methylation, i.e. the PacBio or ONT? I know you did mention the, the nanopore, but are there similar studies being done on these other platforms? So the Pacific Bio for methylation, I think it is launching soon. And uh, we are interested in trying it. So we've been in contact with Pacific Bio. I don't think it's yet available for the public. Um, and I'm pretty sure that many people are gonna try. It's very new using this long read technology to detect. Uh, I know that there has been publication for imprinting using the nanopore um, for imprinting disorders uh, for methylation by um, the group in UBC, uh, but I don't think the Pacific Bio there is anything yet. Uh, that has been published on that. Okay. Um, so, so to come though, it sounds like. It is to come, yes. Yes, okay. Um, Zhejuan Li asks, if the diagnosis of the patient is unclear, how can the signature analysis help diagnosis? And are all the signatures analyzed simultaneously for the potential diagnosis? So um, for now, in our lab, we will we can diagnose multiple signature simultaneously for all the patients. Um, uh, that is uh, really just done in our lab. At P sign as well can do all the 50 genes that I provided that I showed you uh, based on their website, they can do it simultaneously for all of these genes. Um, using Epigen Central, you can do 10 different uh, syndromes simultaneously as well. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, the good news about DNA methylation is like sequencing. The more signature have been identified, and this is an active field of discovery, uh, you can revisit these methylation signature that you have on your patient's profile, and you can reanalyze and reclassify to see if there is a match, like later on, when more signatures are available. So it's something that you'd probably come back to for patients that, that are unequ or equivocal? Yes, yes. Okay. Terrific. So what is the cost of the test? Is that... So clinical, uh, I know EpiSign, I think it's 800, uh, 1500 US for the clinical test. For us, we do it on a research basis, on a collaboration. So you can contact us and we'll discuss that. Okay. Or you can do it if the gene is available within those 10 uh, syndromes, you can do it for free using Epigen, Epigen Central. Um, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question, um, but um, Ender 
Karaka, sorry, um, has asked, is there any ongoing efforts or guideline studies from ClinGen or ACMG or any other group that you're aware of um, that include methylation signature data in variant classification processes? It's a wonderful question. And I would like that this is something that we were thinking of. And we are um, in talks with another database um, to be able to upload the signature classification for variant uh, in missing, which is the autism class, which is the autism database. And we're going to do it as well in Safari. And hopefully this will trigger the other databases to uh, also uh, validate and use this approach to uh, classify the variant. Yeah, using methylation okay. testing. So right now it's not, you're not aware of any group that are using no, it as a guideline. Any, no. But no. but again, as it becomes more available, then maybe, maybe this something will that, definitely, yes, yeah. absolutely. I think that this will really be the, the goal in the future. Terrific. Okay. So there's still several more questions and I'm be watching the time here because we're getting through them, which is good. But uh, Maria uh, Vlad, Vlado, um, asked, are there meth methylation profiles from specific diseases more easily distinguished from the controls than others? For example, if a Weaver patient were compared independently to controls, would they separate? Yes, if you did a differential methylation analysis, it will. But if you take all the probes, no, it will not. Uh, however, a SOTOS patient, if you don't do anything, take all the 850,000 CPG site, you can distinguish a SOTO syndrome from the control or any other um, uh, patient because they have a genome-wide effect. So I would like to add as well that some signature, they have a small effect size uh, and others have a large effect size. And that, this is why it's important to have a larger cohort, uh, at least 10 patients uh, and even more if possible in order to generate a DNA methylation signature and the more important is to be able to validate it in an additional cohort, independent and tested, and do the proper kind of sensitivity specificity testing. So you, do you mean, so you said like the 10 being run at the same time or, yes, or comparing 10 time. people? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Razazi asks, this is a semi-quantitative assay, it seems. Is there a threshold of percentage methylation above this value, the disease below no disease like that. Um, so I think so, it's kind of, what are the thresholds generally? So the threshold that we use to generate a methylation signature cutoff of being, it's a probability between zero to one uh, using the machine learning model that we generate, the support vector machine. And that runs from zero to one. So we know that maybe below 25, and it's really dependent on the disease and on the gene, and you can correct multiple ways for that. So uh, we think based on our uh, experience so far that above 50% uh, usually it's mostly associated or we call it positive, below 50, usually we call it negative. And if the controls are below 25, for example, percent, but the, we have like an intermediate case, we also have a lot of, of those uncertain and intermediate that some of them we found that they were because of mosaicism. Um, that's why they had this intermediate classifications, other because it's another syndrome, as I showed you, another gene, or also we found that they, ca they could be because the mutation is outside of the common domain and it has less severe phenotype. And that's why this it has a kind of an intermediate classification. It's really, at this point, I don't think we can kind of have a threshold that is common for everybody or all the genes and all the disorders. Uh, I can tell you specifically for certain genes that based on the, our experience and based on the number of patients that we run, we can kind of uh, put them uh, in three different categories, benign, clearly benign, or clearly pathogenic and intermediate. Those, those vuses catch us all over the place, don't they? Those intermediate yeah. ones. We don't ever seem to get away from those. <laughs> um, Fabiola Quintero Rivera asks, can you please comment on one negative controls? Is this a pool of hundreds of samples and two positive controls? Do you run a positive control with each batch? 
If so, how many positive control samples and which samples do you use? Example, like number of SOTOs or weaver or photocarbers, et cetera. So um, for the discovery, uh, we wish we can run, it's really costly if you want to run 100 control every time. And because of batch effect with these technology with the methylation arrays, we always try to run the discovery cohort in the same batch. So uh, we usually generate like at least, we recommend at least 10 patients uh, with the mutation. Um, like eight to 10, it depends uh, with the positive mutation and the, with a pathogenic mutation in a gene. And it's highly recommended that you run two or three times more the controls, number of the controls. Like if you're running 10, maybe 30 controls will be a good number in order to be able to identify a signature and reduce the noise. Um, but for the specificity, then the batch will not be a problem. Then we have a pool of hundreds of uh, control um, that methylation profile from controls, and we just run them. We use this, uh, this pool of methylation profile from controls, and we test them for the specificity of the signature. Okay. Um, Razazi asks, EZH2 is a chip mutation, so um, clonal Juan Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess that one up. So I'm not. So it's a chip mutation in neoplasms. Uh, so many or all people above 50 may have the, the mutation washout phenotype. So essentially, um, does age come into factor and, and clone uh, chip in older people? Does that impact the analysis? So we did not have access to anyone above 50. Um, uh, I know that I had in this uh, paper where we published the EZH2 signature, we had, um, actually probably we did. So we had, uh, yes, we did, I did, I was wrong. So we tested one patient, one family, three generation family, where we had the grandmother, the mother and the, the, the proben and his sibling. And all of them have the mutation in EZH2 and all of them share the same methylation profile. So we were able to detect it in all the family members that were that have the mutation and had the phenotype. I think though more um, in like the normal controls, if you had an older population, you can sometimes get mutations in EZH2, for example. Yeah. So would that I, affect it? Yeah, I, I can't tell you because we haven't so tested all the controls. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Fabiola Quintero Rivera says, thank you for speaking today, Dr. Trafani. Excellent work and terrific presentation, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, Casey Brewer asks, do you think pathogenic mutations in genes affecting histone acetylation, such as HDAC4, can cause detectable changes in methylation signatures? So we haven't tested that, but it is on our list to test. I know that there have been one gene HDAC, one of the HDAC that has been tested. I can't remember which number. Um, and there was no signature identified, but also the number of patients were just probably four that were tested before. And I, I don't, like, I can't comment on that yet because we haven't done it. Um, I just noticed, um, that we are over time. Um, so I, I do want to say that, that it's a fabulous talk. I, I do recognize that there's still a, a couple of questions. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if maybe um, we could uh, copy down these questions and maybe um, get back to the people or, or who have them, or unless you want to quickly address them, I, I don't know if we're still recording. Um, I could, I could see two quick questions. Hopefully they're quick. Maybe we can, I'm trying to see if, um, if we still have time. Maybe we'll ask them quickly and then at least we have the recordings. We'll try to get the answers to those people. Um, okay. We apparently are still recording. So I'm gonna try to ask them very quickly. Um, there's a question. What is the rate of uncertain methylation classification in your database? Uh... That's a good question. Um, I don't know if it is close to five to 10%, maybe. I'm not sure, this okay. is just a guess. Okay. Like we haven't really measured that, yes. 
and the majority being kind of That's more based on DNA methylation. I'm talking about the uncertain classification based on DNA methylation. Okay, thank you. And then there's only one last one that I can see. Um, do you think methylation signatures could be useful in polygenic risk score studies in the near future? So that's something that it keeps coming. This is a wonderful question. And we're discussing how we can integrate DNA methylation with the polygenic risk score as well. So these are, there is a lot of questions that really things that are on our mind and we are interested to uh, explore as well uh, to see if there is utility and validity in using them as well. Very good question. Thank you. Um, I just want to also point out there's several chat uh, comments here in the chats that it was a fantastic talk. I, I, I totally agree with with those comments. Great presentation. Uh, thank you very, very much um, for stepping in and, and for talking with us today. Um, I learned a lot. Um, personally, I thought it was fabulous. So um, thank you again. And you we all. will have this available as a recording. So if anyone else um, wants to, to go back and look over it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, I hope I was able to answer all the questions. And for those who I wasn't, um, I don't know if there's any way that we can address. And I hopefully that with my, my answers for the other people, we did cover everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.